Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs, uh, the Executive Director of the Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. Um, my guest today is Sakari Bananta. He's a principal investigator. Uh, he's studying cancer and, in particular, metastases and the key molecular drivers that uh, cause it and regulate it, etc. So, Zachary, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, if you would, in, in your own words, tell me uh, what got you into studying this and, and what you're working on. Well, I, I studied medicine uh, as an undergrad, and then uh, I ended up uh, getting interested in, in genetics. And then uh, there's a really great cancer genetics laboratory in Helsinki, where I grew up and went to medical school, uh, Lauri Altonen's group. And, uh, and so I started working there as a summer student initially, and then ended up staying for longer to, to do a PhD in cancer genetics. Uh, and, uh, and that, of course, is a really exciting field, but I kind of had the feeling that genetics can take you really far in understanding how cancer works, but then there's a certain limit at which point you, the genetics uh, doesn't really help you anymore. So I was interested mm. in trying to understand how the genes and mutations in cancer function. And that's how I ended up doing the work I do uh, now, which is um, more kind of experimental. So um, are you trying to figure out what causes metastasis initially or like what are you looking at in particular around it? Um, yes, in principle, yes. So we are trying to understand uh, how... Uh, mutations, cancer mutations, interact with other uh, uh, cellular pathways to, to drive metastasis. And, to, uh, and, uh, and this is very important because, of course, metastasis uh, are the cause of the vast majority of cancer-related deaths. And so to understand how, to, how cancer cells acquire the capability to spread around uh, the body and, and colonize different tissues is, is very important. Uh, but it's still quite poorly understood. So we are trying to understand the mechanisms behind this. Well, um, do you know what what starts a metastasis? Is there a certain critical mass of cells or certain conditions in which the primary tumor cells, you know, have some kind of quorum sensing where they say, okay, it's time to start uh, metastasizing? Or are they doing it the whole time? Uh, what, what's been observed? I think this is something that is still a little bit unclear. So there's some experimental evidence that suggests that metastasis can or cancer cells can leave the primary tumor already quite early on uh, but then there's also kind of genetic data from human tumors uh, that suggests that it may happen quite late uh, and and so I think this is really a kind of a hotly debated uh, question in the field uh, but it is very important because if uh, if we know when at, and at what point cancers can spread uh, it, it has uh, implications on, on the way that uh, process can be targeted uh, in a therapeutic setting. So, what, I mean, what can you tell about metastasis if you if you can't tell when it starts or what it starts? I mean, uh, are you looking for communication then between primary tumor and metastases, or like what, like what are you trying to figure out? What are some of the big questions? Well, uh, I guess what we know is that it happens, right? So, when you have a primary tumor somewhere in the body. And, and patients get diagnosed with that. Uh, unfortunately, even if initially it feels or the, the clinicians think that this is a localized tumor and it can be surgically removed, then the same cancer comes back uh, often in different parts of the body. So we kind of know that it happens and, uh, and it's a major clinical problem. Um, now, um, when it happens, as I said, is 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 unclear, but um, in many ways it's... Uh, it's um, important to to figure out the mechanisms and and how how can how it happens is actually this, this multiple multiple different ways that it can happen. So in in principle, what it means is that as a cell leaves the primary tumor, it has to invade the surrounding tissues. It typically goes uh, into the circulation, uh, blood vessels or in lymphatics, and then it ends up in in one place or another. And I think then the critical 
process is how it survives because cells don't survive everywhere. They, they need signals from the other cells surrounding them. Uh, and so cancer cells need to, to adapt to the new, new uh, environment and I think that is very difficult for them to do. So the, most of the cells die. So I think when you have an advanced cancer, uh, there are huge amounts of cells often leaving the tumor uh, they migrate and end up end up in circulation, and then just uh, get uh, disseminated around the body. But very few of them actually form metastases eventually. So I think it's it's not an orderly process. So even if you look at some of the cartoons of the process, you kind of have these discrete steps that have to happen. But actually, it's very chaotic. And I think in in reality, there there can be millions of circulating tumor cells in the bloodstream of a patient that has an advanced cancer, uh, but most of them will die. And, and this can be seen also in experimental uh, systems. So one of the thing, uh, thing to do is to try to understand what are the pathways and, and genes that allow the cells to survive at the distant side? And could they be perhaps targeted uh, so, that, so that they would die before, before they form clinically detectable metastasis? Well, what about the initial niche construction? Uh, it seems like cancers preferably go to certain spots when they metastasize, you know, like uh, liver cancer will metastasize to certain organs versus lung cancer. Why and how are their preferred sites? I think that is a, a very interesting question in the field. And, and this is called the seed and soil hypothesis of metastasis. So in principle, you have to have a, a specific type of cancer cell, which is the seed, and it can only grow in a specific soil, which would be the target organ. And clinically, this has been observed already uh, in uh, a long time ago. And uh, but but the molecular drivers of that are actually still quite poorly understood. So there are certain certain uh, kind of mechanisms that have been proposed. For example, if for some reason the primary tumor has non-cancer cells which are similar. Uh, to what is seen in a different organ, it could be that the, the cells that thrive best in the in the primary tumor then also would colonize predominantly that specific organ. So, for example, a certain type of uh, myeloid cells might be prevalent in the tumor, and because similar cells also are important in, in the bone marrow, uh, the cells that then end up in the bone marrow might kind of uh, thrive there better than in some other location. But I think in, in many cases, these processes are really poorly understood and there's a, there are a lot of experimental laboratories trying to understand how this happens. And I think this gets to the question I, I, I mentioned er, early on, which is that for a lot of the things that we know about cancer, it comes from genetic analysis of, of human cancer. So where we sequence the whole genome of the tumors and see what mutations they have. And when you have recurrent mutations in specific genes, the interpretation is that these genes are important for, for tumor formation. But uh, when it comes to metastases, genetics hasn't really revealed any specific pathways. And I think that, that then tells us that we have to use experimental systems to, to try to understand the process. And that is actually very difficult. It's very interesting. There are really good scientists around the world working on these problems. But, but it is very challenging to, to, to really give a very specific or clear kind of general description of it. A lot of different types of genes and pathways uh, contribute to the process, uh, but we are still in the middle of trying to understand which of those would be the most important and especially which of those would be the easiest to target so that we could uh, uh, kind of uh, reach some benefit for patients. What does that mean genetics doesn't uh, help characterize metastases? I mean, they would have to have the base mutations plus, I guess, additional new ones. But are you saying the additional new ones above the base, like in the primary tumor, are not, they're always different? Is that what you mean? Or they're heterogeneous? Uh, uh, Kind of. So the current conclusion from this genetic data, so of course now people have, it was a very attractive hypothesis that that you have a primary tumor and it maybe needs uh, X number of mutations, let's say five mutations in principle in key genes in a specific cancer type, to, for the tumor to form. Uh, but then uh, when we sequence uh, metastases, it turns out that they don't consistently have uh, the metastasis mutations. So such things don't seem to exist, even though they are very clear bottlenecks in the process. So they have to go through uh, kind of evolutionary bottlenecks where most of cancer cells die and, and 
and kind of evidence from microbiology, for example, when you have specific selective pressures, let's say drugs on bacteria, they tend to get mutations. And even cancers, when we, when we treat them with specific cancer drugs, they tend to gen- uh, get mutations that uh, then make them resistant. So their thinking was that, that uh, it would make sense logically that there would be also metastasis mutations like that. But nobody has been able to identify genetic alterations that would give cancer cells metastatic capabilities. Uh, and so there are no clear uh, driver mutations that would be needed for, for an aggressive primary tumor cell to become a metastatic, primary, uh, metastatic cancer cell. And so this, I think, means that, uh, and this is actually something that we are really trying to understand in our work, also in the laboratory, is that maybe the mutations that are in the primary tumor already do different things in some cancer clones, and that is important for metastasis formation. And we have actually some evidence that that in kidney cancer specifically, these tumors are almost always uh, initiated by mutations in the von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor. And there's a clear cellular response to that, which is activation of transcription factors called uh, hypoxia-inducible transcription factors. And that seems to be important for primary tumor formation. Uh, But the, these transcription factors actually do different things in cells which can form metastases and which cannot. So these are heritable uh, epigenetic mechanisms, but not really mutation-based. And so this is something that we are actively investigating, and, and other labs are also investigating these mechanisms. But it seems that they are not mutations, but rather these metastatic phenotypes come from a different functional consequences of the same mutations that drive the primary tumor. Well, so if you compare genetically primary tumor cell versus a metastasis, you can't see any genetic differences or the genetic differences don't seem to correlate with any additional capabilities. It's the latter. So basically, in, in principle, if you just take two cancer cells, in fact, two any normal cells from the hu- same human, there are always mutations. So basically, the cell division and, and, and replication, uh, DNA replication is, is error prone. So there's always some mutations. So if you take two cancer cells or two cancer clones or metastases versus a primary tumor, uh, you do always see differences. But you don't see consistent differences that would say that the statistical evidence that these mutations correlate with the metastatic phenotype, but rather they seem to be random, what we call passenger mutations, which are in the cancer cells, and uh, but they don't seem to be giving a selective advantage to the clone uh, so that uh, we could say that, okay, these are metastases causing mutations. Yeah, but have you compared, you know, again, let's say a certain cancer always seems to first metastasize to, I don't know, the liver. Um, if you compare the liver metastases, do they grow in the same way? Are they as heterogeneous? Do they seem to have different mechanisms of action? You know, because they're attached to the liver, do they act differently? I mean, what can you say about them that, that does characterize right. them? Yeah, so there, there definitely are mechanisms that, uh, even from different cancers, metastasizing the same organ, same target organ, they there is evidence that similar mechanisms would be giving those cells the metastatic phenotype. And I think this makes sense because, because all organs in, in humans and, and well in, in other organisms as well have a very unique structure, very unique niche where the stem cells are and they maintain the homeostasis of those organs. Uh, and, uh, and it's not so that you can take any kind of cell from any other organ and put it in a different organ and they would be fine. They don't. And so they need to be able to, uh, to thrive in a specific uh, environment. And so, yes, similar, same genes get activated in different types of cancers, and that drives metastasis to, to, to uh, the same metastatic sites. Uh, but it, I think often it seems that the mechanisms through which these genes get activated may be quite different. And again, there's a, a evidence from, from our work uh, as well, where we, we show that there's a, there's a, a cellular respe- receptor, a chemokine receptor called CXCF4, and that is regulated in kidney cancer uh, and uh, breast cancer cells differently, even though it, it gives them metastatic, uh, enhanced metastatic uh, capabilities, it seems that different genetic pathways drive the expression in the metastatic clones. So there's definitely convergence in terms of the function, but it seems that there's, there are different mechanisms that I, I think have uh, kind of the roots in the in the epigenetic state of the cell of origin or the tissue type of origin. And that has a very strong influence 
on even advanced cancer clones. But those mechanisms are still quite poorly understood and we and others are trying to understand how the epigenetic state of the cell and the mutations that cause cancer interact. So it's, it really is a fascinating topic and, and, and I think there's a lot of evidence coming from genetics and then from other sources that there must be a very tight interaction between the kind of normal cellular pathways and mutations and then together, uh, then together those uh, uh, kind of lead to cancer cells being able to do whatever the cancer cells do. But we, we still don't understand these uh, pathways uh, thoroughly. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. How successful are metastases or how destructive do they, you know, if you have a primary tumor, from what I've heard, they seem to be able to be, they seem to be able to live within their initial niche and be less harmful to it, at least locally. And the metastases, I guess, are more aggressive, less cooperative with their local microenvironments and more aggressive about setting up their microenvironments. Like, like how would you characterize them macroscopically, you know, primary versus metastases? I think this depends on the case. I think sometimes they can match really well. Uh, so you can really tell that, okay, these, these are matching. Uh, whereas other types, I think it could be that they're quite different. Uh, and so I think a lot of, often in cancer, a lot of different things can happen. And even in the same patient, you might have different metastases that have very different microenvironments, for example. And that's been recently shown as well when people characterize not only the cancer cells in these metastases, but also the, all the immune cells and, and, uh, and other kind of non-cancer cells, stromal cells, we say. Uh, and so there can be a lot of heterogeneity in within the patient and of course then across different uh, uh patients as well but i think there's there seems to be some constraints to that as well because even if that's the case it tends to be so that the cancers of a certain organ uh tend to kind of resemble each other there might be multiple subtypes and this might be heterogeneity but even then remar- these cancer phenotypes are remarkably uh, reproducible across different patients and, and populations. Uh, so, so there's kind of both. There's 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 order, but there's also chaos, and 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 that is really something that uh, everybody is still trying to understand. Well, how does um, resection and chemo and radiation affect primaries versus metastases? Has there been a study to look for given types of cancer the effect? Um, Yes, uh, I think definitely, again, uh, there's a lot of uh, variability. And so I think that there's uh, evidence for, for both. I think there's, there's cases where the same treatment uh, works across different metastases and primaries in the same patient, whereas then you might have also uh, cases where, where the therapy that in principle works then doesn't work in, in, in certain, uh, certain tumors of the patient. And I think, again, as I mentioned, so there's heterogeneity in terms of the genetics, but also in terms of the microenvironment, and all these things contribute to, to different responsiveness. Uh, but again, I think drug uh, resistance is, is obviously a major, major problem. Uh, and, uh, and it often appears. Uh, and, uh, and another kind of really important open question in the field. Well, what about the initial setup of a metastasis? Um, are you studying that? And what, what clues there can you gain? Because again, if, if a certain cancer for the most part, always tends to metastasize to a certain target. You know, why? What? What is it about it that does it? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, some of that could be all kind of trivial circular, circulatory pattern type of things. So, for example, uh, a lot of cells end up in the kidney, uh, sorry, in, in the lungs, for example, from the kidney cancer, but many other cancers as well, if they drain into to the lymph nodes and then enter the circulation, they end up in the lungs. Whereas from uh, colon cancer, for example, through the portal vein system, the cells end up being in the liver first. So I think certain things like this uh, will uh, explain some of it. But there's obviously other cases where this is not at all the explanation. And and I think this is this is a really important question. Uh, but again, something that we don't really know uh, what, the, what the mechanisms are. Uh, but I think the early stages of metastasis in many ways is, is an important uh, kind of uh, point to think about because... Uh, because uh, as I said, so often, even if you have a patient that has a localized tumor and that gets surgically uh, removed, then some of the patients will develop metastasis later on. And in many ways, it seems logical and intuitive that 
before the metastasis have become clinically d- detectable, the cells might be easier to target. There would be fewer of them. They wouldn't be growing as ag- aggressively. So the kind of idea of having adjuvant therapies, which is like after su- surgery, you try to treat patients, uh, that would make sense if you could uh, have that molecularly targeted uh, in, in the right way. And of course, there's evidence that such therapies work in some cancers, but other cancers, there's no adjuvant therapy. So it means that we don't understand what allows those disseminated cells before they form form uh, clinically detectable metastases to survive. And again, there's different theories as to what those cells are doing. It could be that they are just dormant. They are sitting there, they're not doing anything, or that they are kind of dividing and growing very slowly, but then also they might be uh, take, uh, kind of killed by the immune system or, or other, other reasons. Uh, and then there's also the idea that they, actually they're just growing very slowly and, and because they have left late and there's only very few cells, and, and it just takes time for those, those, those to emerge, the metastasis to emerge. But either way, it would be ideal to treat patients before they have symptoms, before the metastases are so big that, that it's difficult to treat them. And so there's a lot of interest in, in trying to understand those early steps of metastasis. Um, the problem there is that it is very difficult to do that work because that process can take up to decades in humans and, and experimental models are very difficult to to use uh, use animal models they they don't even live that long so it's hard to 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 study that and then from a clinical point of view because they are not detectable so it's very hard to go into patients and take them out and study them what they are doing because by definition we don't know where they are and what they do what they look like and and so i think this is a really a major kind of challenge for for cancer biology and metastasis research in general and there's very interesting developments uh, taking place in this field. And, and it, it relates to model development and then kind of conceptual development as to what those cells are doing and how they could be targeted. And it really is important, but it, it's very challenging to do. And, and, and but, but anyway, we'll, we'll get there at some point. Has anyone tried to, um, let's say, use a mouse model where a mouse has a primary tumor and deliberately take cells and try to seed them into a target organ? that normally a cancer would metastasize to and see if it takes faster? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, that is the kind of experiments that, that we use as well in the lab to kind of study in, in, in experimental mouse models how, how metastatic cells uh, survive and what are the genes that they, they need for survival. So we can use then genetic tools to, uh, to, to take out genes, to knock them out using the gene scissors uh, CRISPRs. Or, or then silencing those genes. And then I think that is the kind of way to do genetic analysis of metastasis is, is precisely through that kind of experiments. And they are very informative. And, and of course, uh, there's always the question of like, how does that work re- relate then to, to real human cancer? And, and I think there, what we do is we use uh, correlative analysis from human data sets. So there's, there are a lot of large uh, uh, cohorts of, 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 of samples have been analyzed from human patients. We have D- DNA level data from those sequencing data, but also gene expression data and RNA seq data. And then also now we're starting to get more kind of uh, analysis of the chromatin landscapes of those cells uh, or tumors. And then we can compare these uh, hu- uh, patterns seen in humans with those that we see in, in experimental models. And, and I think remarkably often we see a lot of similarities. There's, of course, always some differences, uh, but there are, as I mentioned earlier, differences always, even if you take uh, two cells from the same same cancer in the same patient, or even, and of course, between different cancers from different patients. So there's heterogeneity, but I think there's a lot of also patterns that are really reproducible across human data to experimental systems. And then we can study these by taking genes out and expressing them and, and doing all kinds of, uh, using genetic tools in the lab to understand the process. And, and it has really been uh, transformative in the past, let's say, 20 years uh, in the field. Uh, but the process is so complex that, that we still don't know uh, exactly what is happening. But I think there's, there's been a lot of progress. So what do you think that's going to be able to be figured out about metastases maybe in the next you know, year or so based on your work? Is there any, any things you're getting, uh, you're getting close to understanding? Or is it still, I mean, who knows? Right. I mean, I think we, we are always making some progress, but I think it's slow. 
and I think one year in experimental work is quite quite a short time. And I think I would I would hope that let's say in the next ten years or so, uh, we would have a lot better idea of of well, we study mostly kidney cancer to understand what are the signals and, and genetic pathways that that support uh, kidney cancer metastasis in in one specific context or, or in a genetic context. And I think this is just uh, uh, to say that I mean cancer is is kind of one disease in the sense that that uh, the same principles apply. There's cells that get transformed and they start growing in places where they shouldn't. Uh, but uh, actually, it's it's uh, it's a range of diseases. There's hundreds of different subtypes of cancer from different organs and even within the same cell types or, or from the same cell types, different types of cancers can can arise. And so I think there's a lot of detailed analyses by different groups who, who really specialize in their own own field to really understand the systems and the disease and i think that's the way that we 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 best can make progress in trying to understand the molecular mechanisms uh, so i think it will take a little while but eventually we will find out what genes specific cancers and specific types of metastasis will need and once we know that what the pathways are what genes uh, are are important then i think it's really time to think about how to target that and then, of course, that's also work that is going on in parallel. Uh, but uh, but I think it, it is a long long process, and we, we shouldn't expect too much really uh, quickly. But eventually, uh, I'm sure the community will be able to figure out the kind of the really the genetic uh, basis of, of cancer and metastasis. If um, the mutations though are are common, at least in primaries of a given cancer type, wouldn't that mean they're deterministic? I mean the uh... The cells are not just randomly mutating along a path, but they're, you know, acquiring uh, these mutations in a certain order. Right. So I, I think uh, most likely, I think most people think that the mutations in, in principle are acquired randomly and different causes underlie kind of the development of certain type of mutations. But what then, how these specific mutational patterns show up in, in cancers, because only certain combinations and certain mutations in certain tissues give the cells a selective advantage. And that's how they outgrow the others. And that's how we have this enrichment of, of, of mutations. Now, uh, and there's very, very strong genetic data for all this from multiple different cancer types. And also there is evidence from inherited cancer syndrome. So, so people with mutations in, in, in specific genes develop uh, cancer at very high frequency in specific tissues Again, if I go back to kidney cancer, which is what we study, uh, mutations in this von Hippel Lindau tumor suppressor gene, uh, if you inherit one copy of mutant VHL, you have a very high risk of, of developing kidney cancer uh, during your lifetime. Uh, there's other, other cancers also, but it's, it's not that you have a risk, you are at risk of developing all kinds of cancers, but it's normally a very specific uh, pattern of cancers. Now, uh, so there's, there's genetic data that really uh, is uh, supportive of this, but what has emerged very recently uh, is that actually in many tissues, many normal tissues, when people sequence that and take tiny, tiny pieces of, let's say, the esophagus or skin, there are areas which look normal, but they are clonally expanded and they actually have similar mutations that cancers have. And so, so I think there is clearly evidence that the mutations are important. But what they do in different contexts is is actually perhaps more important than has been appreciated, uh, for example, still uh, uh, 10 years ago. And so I think it's become increasingly important that we don't just do the genetics and understand or see what mutations uh, specific uh, cancers or cells have, but we need to understand how what the consequences of those mutations are in specific contexts. And, and so... So uh, I think that's kind of the way I think about mutations and, and cancer uh, at the moment. Well, very good. Uh, Sagari, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and to follow up? Oh, yeah, our work. So we have a website, of course, which has some some uh, kind of uh, information of our work. Of course, we publish papers. So that's one one thing. Uh, we sometimes even do some public lectures and, and open days. So that's that's another, another way that Cambridge University has... Uh, the science festival every, every year uh and and then of course people can email email me if they have some specific questions uh there are also resources like the cancer research uk has 
a really nice website uh, where they have a lot of kind of statistics and information, more kind of patient directed uh, 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 information on symptoms and, and treatments, but also kind of epidemiological data. So there's a lot of a lot of out there, I think, uh, especially if you, if you look for the right sources, uh, I think you can find a lot of information. Oh, well, one more question I wanted to ask you, we can put this back in. Um, I, have you looked at or are you looking at the, uh, the microbiome of, you know, primary tumors and possibly metastases to see if there's any clues there? Right. I think that's a very interesting question. And of course, something that is coming up across different fields, uh, not cancer only, but, but all kinds of medical kind of uh, research. Uh, I know people are, are studying these, but but we are not uh, doing that. So I, I, I don't really know. I think that field hasn't quite matured yet to a point where we would have a consensus so that people who are not specifically in that uh, niche would actually have a good opinion on, on, on what, what, what the potential role of micro, the microbiome is in this. But I should say that this, of course, one, one thing is the kind of viral induced cancers, which is a whole specific thing. I think that has been shown quite, quite clearly. And there are specific examples like that, but not, not in the general. I think the microbiome is, is still, that's an open question. Very interesting and exciting, uh, but still something that we don't know and, uh, particularly well. Mm. Well, very good. So, Craig, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, it was very nice talking to you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.